And welcome to Cambridge Forum. I'm Pat Zerke, director of Cambridge Forum, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you on this damp but not torrential night as we host James Carroll discussing his newest book, Christ Actually, the Son of God for the Secular Age. Our forum tonight will be moderated by Harvey Cox, the Hollis Research Professor of Divinity at Harvard, where he began teaching in 1965. He is the author of more than a dozen books, including The Future of Faith and Common Prayers, Faith, Family, and a Christian's Journey Through the Jewish Year. Cox argues for a new ecumenism in which Christians ignore dogma and embrace spirituality while finding common threads with other religions. James Carroll begins his newest book, Christ Actually, the Son of God for the Secular Age, with a question from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Lutheran pastor imprisoned and executed by the Nazis. In a letter from prison, Bonhoeffer asked, who is Christ actually for us today? After the Holocaust, after Hiroshima, after a century of war and society's drift away from religion that followed, Carol takes up the same question. What can Jesus mean for us today? He finds a hopeful answer in a surprising place. Looking at Jesus' identity as a Jewish human being, Carol finds a Christ who was no Christian himself, but who transcends Christianity and who speaks to the people of today's world. James Carroll is the author of 11 novels and seven previous works of nonfiction. I remember your first novel, Madonna Red. <laughs> That's a while back. His memoir, An American Requiem, received the 1996 National Book Award in nonfiction. Constantine Sword, The Church and the Jews, A History, was a New York Times bestseller and was honored as best book by, in 2002 by the Los Angeles Times, the Christian Science Monitor, and others. Welcome to the Cambridge Forum, Jim Carroll. Hands up. Don't shoot. I can't breathe. Hands up, don't shoot. I can't breathe. Black Lives Matter. I can't breathe. Our text. I am so honored to be here. I know very well the tradition of the Cambridge Forum. And I sense, too, all the angels hovering in this holy and great place. I have to begin especially by acknowledging what an honor it is to be on the platform with Harvey Cox. Harvey is an old friend, so therefore biased in my favor. But more to the point, tonight. His work, going back decades, has been the foundation on which my own thinking and believing stands. And I'm especially grateful to have this chance at long last to pay proper homage to the debt I owe to Harvey Cox. No one dares to put the phrase, the secular age, in the subtitle of his book without nodding gratefully at Harvey Cox, whose book, The Secular City, transformed the inner life of the whole Christian church. Certainly, it transformed mine. If you had told me in 1967 
that Harvey Cox and I would be conversation partners on the occasion of a book of mine, I would have assumed I had gone to heaven. But it's only Harvard Square. <laughs> Either way, thank you, Harvey, for getting me here. When the Cambridge Forum agreed some months ago to welcome me and my new book tonight, none of us knew that this nation would be upended in these days by recognitions tied to Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamar Rice, and through them to countless others. We are a properly chastened people. Hands up. I can't breathe. My book is Christ Actually, the Son of God for the Secular Age. My remarks will take off from that tension the way normally that we treat faith in the Son of God as opposed to the secular age. In Christ Actually, I lay out a whole set of such oppressive oppositions and show how horribly enough they are tied to what we think of Jesus Christ. So, Son of God versus the secular age, faith versus reason, religion versus science, miracles versus evidence, one side of the brain versus the other, us versus them, The argument of my book is straightforward. That the profound oppositionalisms that might be understood as cursing the human condition take the form they do in Western culture overwhelmingly because of the greatest story ever misremembered. I argue that while the conflict laid bare in this country in Ferguson, Cleveland, and New York has many sources, it draws a lethal energy from a conflict that lies buried beneath the surface of Western civilization, going back to a misremembered Jesus Christ. I want, perhaps outrageously, to suggest that there is a bug in the software of Christianity, which became a bug in the software of Western civilization, a bug showing up here and now with fresh and undeniable power. Black lives matter less than white lives. Immigrants, too. What is that? Where does it come from? In fact, we could recite a whole litany of oppositions, all rooted, if not exclusively, then in some essential way, in the structure of the imagination of what we once called Christendom, Moving backward in time, if you will, from white versus black in contemporary America to slave versus free to settlers versus native peoples, retracing the way back across the oceans to European imperialist adventurers versus people of color, wherever they found them, black, but also brown, and yellow, and red. Everywhere, the Europeans, newly self-conscious as white, established colonies. Going back even 
before the colonies to Pope-launched crusades versus infidel Muslims. God wills it, which precisely in Europe's founding centuries, as European culture and the European mind was gelling, this tension between the crusaders and the infidels established a positive, negative bipolarity between Christendom and Islam that defines politics to this day. This crusade, as George W. Bush put it, this war on terror, as it still is, and because since God wills it, you can do anything against the infidel, including enhanced interrogation, interrogation techniques, torture, and the lies it requires. This question in the words spoken by the unlikely John McCain yesterday, isn't about our enemies. It's about us. At the risk of oversimplifying a vast and complex question, I want to suggest a connection with such white, black, positive, negative imagination that puts a profound responsibility on those of us who revere the memory of Jesus Christ. Hands up. Don't shoot. Somehow, the generating paradigm of such racist contempt goes back to a sacred and still vital Christian contempt for Jews. I know it seems a stretch, but bear with me. The blood impurity of Jews, an invention of the Inquisition in the 15th and 16th centuries, moved religious anti-Judaism into racial anti-Semitism. The invention, yes, of racism just in time for European colonialism. Before, Jews could become acceptable to Christian society by accepting baptism. But in the 15th and 16th centuries, not even baptized Jews were acceptable. They were denigrated, oddly, as conversos, making a point of their conversion. For a crucial period at the dawn of modernity, conversos and their equally baptized offspring were not eligible to hold municipal office, nor qualified to enter the holy orders of the church at key places throughout Europe. Example, the Jesuits, the jewel of the church, banned anyone of Jewish descent going back generations from entering the Society of Jesus, a constitutional restriction that was lifted only after the Holocaust. The impurity was not in belief, but in blood. And where had this now biological contempt come from? from centuries of the church versus the synagogue, a structure of mind, imagination, 
and culture, a structure of theology, a positive, negative structure of Christian self-understanding that showed up in grace versus law, faith versus works, generosity versus greed, all the way back to something as basic as new versus old, as in New Testament versus Old Testament, the God of mercy versus the God of judgment. You might say that such bipolarity is tied to the divided human brain or to the universal and quite ancient pressures of our tribal roots, survival, a matter of knowing who is in our circle and who is not, us against them, as a matter of survival. True, broadly human condition here. But when it comes to the church and the Jews, this entire tension was made apocalyptic, for with the deicide charge, Christ killers were God killers, this tension made the bipolarity a matter of divine mandate, God against the Jewish people. This is a cosmic bipolarity. After recognitions tied to the Holocaust, which stripped bare the uneasy anti-Jewish conscience of the West, the churches renounced that deicide charge, declaring especially at the Roman Catholic Vatican Council in 1965 that the Jewish people must not be indicted as Christ killers. Since then, alas, Christians have been mostly complacent about this problem, but we have barely begun to address it because the Christ killer charge is only the tip of the iceberg. Here is the bug in the software. The entire story of Jesus is told as a story of Jesus against the Jews. Everywhere you look in the Gospels and in Acts, we find this with the contemptuous phrase, the Jews, used well over a hundred times. Jesus is remembered simply as if he were a Gentile. All of his virtues, kindness, egalitarianism, feminism, mercy, universalism, are seen in contrast to Jewish venality legalism, tribalism, chauvinism, pettiness, greed. The parables, the story of the Good Samaritan could equally be known as the story of the bad Jews. The Gospel of John, he came unto his own and his own received him not. No. The only ones who received Jesus were his own people, Jews. It was Jews, only Jews, who, in that poignant phrase of the ancient historian Josephus, could not let go of their affection for him. Jesus was a Jew. Fully, completely, we would say, an orthodox Jew to the day he died, preaching not a God of love against a God of judgment, but the one God of Israel whose judgment and love are one. More, Jesus Christ was a Jew the categories within which he was understood as Messiah 
as raised from the dead, as son of God, somehow divine, as seated at the right hand of the Father, were Jewish categories. The Christian assumption is that these affirmations cut Jesus off forever from Judaism. They don't. They are profoundly Jewish affirmations for contingent historical reasons, not the will of God, having mainly to do with what I presume to call the first Holocaust, which was the Roman war against the Jewish people, which killed perhaps two million Jews, and with the intra-Jewish civil war that the Roman war sparked, both raging just as the Gospels were written, through all of that, Jesus was profoundly misremembered by the generations that came after him. The Gospels are war literature, and reading them without reference to the Roman wars that unfolded while they were being written is equivalent, and we Christians always do this, equivalent to reading the diary of Anne Frank without reference to the Holocaust. The result, Jesus against the Jews, as if he were not one of them. The bug in the software of the church, which became the bug in the software of Western civilization. How to debug the software? We Christians, those of us who are Christians, have a profound responsibility here. No, not all the world's problems begin with us, but some do and some essential ones beat on because of us. We have a profound responsibility here. Three quick points. First, we must understand far more fully than we do how our apparently anti-Jewish texts came to be written the way they are. And that we have to also far more fully grasp that it is wrong to remember this story, the story of Jesus, as anti-Jewish at all, which requires understanding how the text came to be written, and it requires a new way of understanding them. Central to that is real knowledge of the Roman destruction of the temple in the year 70, an event that barely registers in Christian memory, although it defines Jewish memory, an event that occurred exactly when, as scholars now tell us, the first gospel, Mark, was written, hello. It is plausible to assert that Mark was written as a response to the destruction of the temple. Why would that be so? Without the temple, which had centered Jewish belief for a thousand years, every Jew was all at once thrown into a crisis of faith. What is it to be a Jew without the temple? And two surviving groups answered that question differently. One group answered, now more than ever, there is an imagined temple in the study of Torah and practice of the law the rabbis 
who gave us what we call Judaism. The other group answered, now there is an imagined temple in Jesus. Jesus. And Mark tells us this, is the new temple. Tension developed between these two groups. The tension one could say, of civil war. This was a post-traumatic stress context. And these people were all traumatized. And as violent imperial oppression always does, the imperial power sparked civil conflict among the peoples that were being oppressed. The British did it in Ireland. They did it in Pakistan, India. They did it in Palestine. And the Romans did it in Palestine first. A tension between these two groups of Jews that became ferociously polemical. And one record of that polemic is the Gospels, which as the decades move from Mark in 70 through Matthew and Luke in 80 and John in 100, and I know you know this chronology, but we must insist upon it. As those decades moved, the polemic became fiercer and fiercer, so that by the time of the Gospel of John, which uses the contemptuous phrase, the Jews, more than any other, by that time, Jesus is heard calling the Jewish people, his opponents, the children of Satan, the demonizing of Jews, or in Elaine Pagel's great phrase, the origin of Satan. But these people engaged in this polemic were all Jews. They were Jews arguing over what is it to be a good Jew. Sound familiar? When finally the Romans, in a last paroxysm of violence, destroyed the entire city of Jerusalem, wiping it out as they had wiped out Carthage in the year 135. They scattered the core of the Jewish Jesus people. And after that, the Jesus movement became more and more dominated by Gentiles, who, no fault of their own, knew nothing of this Jewish history knew nothing of the Jewish sources of the texts, and more pointedly, knew nothing of the Jewishness of Jesus. They could imagine Jesus as one of them. This was an accident of history. It was not the will of God. And it was wrong. Jesus was a Jew, period, full stop. If Christians had not forgotten that, The history of the last 2,000 years culminating, yes, at Auschwitz would be very different. There are one and a half billion Christians in the world. There are 15 million Jews. Two groups that began together as equal minorities in the Roman Empire, both amounting to about 10% of the population. How did that disparity come about? Second, we must measure everything we say and believe about Jesus against this full and permanent Jewishness of his. Therefore, none of this merciful God of the New Testament rescuing us from the damning God of the Old Testament. We must, in effect, change our Christology. Jesus was human. Denying his Jewishness is denying that. Jesus was in some way divine. We affirm that. We must affirm it by all means if we're Christians. But we must grasp the divinity of Jesus in ways that do not set him against his own people, 
with, for example, a shallow notion of Jewish monotheism, this requires a re-examination, say, of the Greek philosophical terms of our basic theology and a rediscovery of the Jewish modes of thinking in which Jesus himself and his first followers understood him. And always, we must remember that when we say that Jesus was somehow God, we do not know, except in the cloud of unknowing, what such language refers to. What if the so-called divinity of Jesus lays bare not so much the mystery of God as the majesty of what it is to be human? The divinity of Jesus in some way suggests the divinity in which we all participate. Yes, that is a change in theology, but a changed understanding of Jesus is the point, and it is now essential. And third, we Christians, and I don't presume by any means that everyone here is Christian, we Christians must hear the anti-Jewish texts of the New Testament as if we ourselves are Jews. If you are a Christian, invite a Jewish friend to come to church with you, not just to the slanderous liturgies of Holy Week, His blood be upon us and upon our children. No, to services any Sunday. Why, they might ask, has the word Pharisee which refers to an exemplary religious order in Israel, become a synonym for her hypocrite. Who are these, the Jews, I keep hearing about? Why is every virtue of Jesus shown against Jewish villainy? Once we Christians hear and read our texts with a Jewish ear and a Jewish eye, we will want something new and different from our preachers, nothing less than that our preachers should preach these texts against themselves. Hands up, don't shoot. Black lives matter. We see that. But may we truly respond to deeper things that we can learn in the name of Eric and Michael and Tamir. Black versus white, us versus them, the West versus Islam, science versus religion, the Son of God versus the secular age, positive against negative. Are we condemned to such bipolarity? The answer must be no. That negation, of course, is an affirmation, an affirmation for some of us of the faith. All human divisions, those between us and those within us, can be reconciled in the oneness of God, who is the one God of Israel, Shema, the one God in Isaiah's end time vision of all people, the creator of the cosmos in the Genesis vision, in whose love we all find our hope and, whom, and in whom we all find our peace. May Eric and Michael and Tamir rest in peace. And may their families find justice. Of course they won't. Unless we, this entire society, finds a new way to dispense justice. Which is our subject. And that task belongs not to God, but to us.
<clears throat> it's a great treat for me to be here tonight with one of my oldest friends, uh, comrade and compatriot and colleague. <clears throat> and to commend you this book, which is, I remind you, is going to be for sale here at the end of the proceedings. It's hard for any writer not to be a little envious of the way Jim Carroll does his work. The mixture of his command for scholarly material, biblical studies, and the genius of his prose as a novelist is bound to make you a little envious. So I confess that this evening. I commend this book to you, and I'm not going to say much more about the book. <clears throat> Rather, I want to use my few minutes here to pose two questions to Jim that I think might start off our discussion together here this evening. And they both have to do with the title, or rather the subtitle, of his wonderful book. <clears throat> the book is Jesus, of, the book is ac Christ actually, the Son of God for the secular age. I want to raise questions both about the secular age and about the Son of God in that order. <clears throat> First of all, are we really living in a secular age? Really? When you look around the world, it doesn't seem to be that way. With all the mayhem erupting in the Middle East, between Sunnis and Shias, with the, uh, with the, what we're witnessing is not really a secular age at all, although this was predicted by many people, even me, <laughs> some years ago, and also by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who thought that, as he said, we'll be coming in soon to a world of no religion at all. That did not happen. happen. We aren't really living in a secular age. We're, we're living in an age in which there has been a spectacular an unanticipated revival, renaissance of religion all around the world, and that is good news and bad news. Look at the uh, battles between the Sunni and the Shia Muslims. Look at the rise of militaristic Shinto again in Japan. Japan. Look at the influence of the religious right in America. Look at the murders and and knifings occurring around the holy sites of Jerusalem. Sometimes I think what we need is more secularization, a little less religion to inflame people's passions. I don't think that the secular age adequately catches the portrait of our time. And I want to know if Jim uh, thinks so when he responds here. Now, there's also a positive side, of course, to this revival or renaissance of religion. I was deeply moved a few years ago when I saw the first bar mitzvah to take place in Warsaw. In Warsaw, right on the soil where six million Jews were exterminated. A, a, a new breath of life in, in, a, in a land of death. How about the spread of Pentecostalism throughout Latin America and Africa, bringing a certain kind of healing and hope to lots and lots of hopeless people? What about the, uh, the new birth and growth of Christianity and Buddhism in China, which we uh, had not expected and which certainly the Chinese communists had not expected? What about all of that? And what about the astonishing and I think well-deserved popularity of Pope Francis, perhaps especially among non-Catholics, <laughs> of Pope Francis. <clears throat> I now think of Jim Carroll and Pope Francis as my two favorite Catholics. <clears throat> <laughs> no, it, it, is, it doesn't appear to me uh, an adequate or useful description of our age to call it a secular age. Uh, it's an age of religion, of rampant religious pluralism, with confluence, with conflict among the religious groups, with borrowing. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. More interfaith meetings, more ecumenism, and more mayhem and, inter and sectarian strife. This is the age I think we have to think about as we understand how to interpret Jesus Christ for our age. For our age. 
This is a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a task we have to take up, and I, Jim, Jim has outlined one, one enormously if central part of that task, which is what might be called the, the re re reclamation of the Jewishness of Jesus, which has been so eradicated and deleted over so many centuries. I think that's central. But then there is the next step, because what we see now in the world is many of the people in the world, most of the people in the world, uh, who think of themselves as Christians nowadays, uh, are living in, uh, in, in cultures in which the Christian and Jewish heritage have not formed the culture. They're living in the, in the southern world, in the eastern world, in China and south, in Africa, and a whole different kind of Christology is required. Jim says we need a new Christology, and I could not agree more. We certainly do. But how do we understand this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, uh, this Jewish Jesus, as the one that we, that we interpret to this, uh, this uh, global world of rival uh, religious and non-religious and anti-religious groups. So that brings me to the phrase, the Son of God. For many years, I taught a course at Harvard for undergraduates on Jesus. And to my great surprise, the course drew large numbers of students who did not consider themselves Christian at all. <coughs> Excuse me. There were Hindus, there were Buddhists, there were Muslims, there were Jews, there were humanists. Why had they come to a course about, about Jesus? They understood him as a bodhisattva, perhaps as a manifestation of the divine, as a prophet of Allah, God. Jesus seemed to me each year to grow larger than the church, bigger than Christianity, and indeed bigger and larger than any of the titles that we have thought up over the years from the Bible on to designate who he is. <coughs> In the centuries since the Bible, Christians have uh, thought, uh, in the Bible and since then, Christians have thought of a lot of different ways of describing Jesus. The Son of Man, the Messiah, the Son of David, the uh, Prince of Peace, the Lord, the Alpha Omega, the, the Savior, the Bright and Morning Star. Think of all these titles. <coughs> and, among, <coughs> and among all these titles, there is one with its own history and its own layers of significance, and it's called the Son of God. We know that each of these titles reveals something, sometimes not very much, but something about who Jesus was and who Jesus is. But none of these titles actually capture, <coughs> capture the deep reality of all that Jesus is and all that, all that he was. <coughs> Excuse me. No, what I learned about that in that course about Jesus over all those years is that he is much, much bigger than any theological formulation, any institutional uh, structure, that he has an attraction and a power that goes far beyond any of these. And that is the Jesus I hope we can interpret uh, together. <coughs> people with the eloquence and theological insight of Jim Carroll and, and others as well, in this expanding Christianity that's moving all around the world and taking its roots in Asia, in China, in, in South America and Africa. That's the Christological task that, that I think lies before us, a post-secular age of religious revival, confusing, threatening, conflictual, but still, that's the world we've been given to live in. And as Hans Kung has written, <coughs> we cannot have peace among the nations and the peoples unless we have peace among the religions. So we desperately need to cultivate mutual trust, understanding among these disparate religions and, and non-religious worldviews, and to live together on one tiny little shrunken blue planet. 
Realizing this is an indispensable first step to beginning this new Christology, this new understanding of Jesus. Jesus the Jew. For the world now. God's promise to Abraham was that his descendants would bless the entire world, all peoples. That is still the promise. I am not sure, however, myself, that among all these different titles that I've just enumerated, the title Son of God is the best choice or the most promising choice for this task. When we talk to our Jewish brothers and sisters, I think we'll find that calling Jesus the Son of God doesn't necessarily advance the conversation that much. When we talk to our Buddhist and Hindu friends, calling Jesus the Son of God may also be something of an obstacle. Gandhi, you know, once said, of course I believe in Jesus is the Son of God, but not the Son of God. That's the, that's the territory we have landed in now, this, this new global and post-secular world in which we have this Christological task to do. Because the titles that we have so far are all, they're finite, useful in their own way, but we need to keep working at that. Uh, one other point before I close, and that is that I was hoping that sometime in this book, maybe the next book, uh, 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 Jim Carroll might deal with the role of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. Uh, we are supposed to be Trinitarians, but when I read through his book, there isn't any mention of the Spirit, the Great Spirit, the Holy Spirit, what the Iroquois call the Great Spirit, the divine presence that Paul Tillich talked about, not even referenced in the, uh, in the uh, uh, index. There is another whole book for you to write, Jim. And I, 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 I eagerly await, because you'll do a wonderful job with it. We may be living in a time in which talking with our friends around the world about the spirit, about the living spirit, the life-giving spirit, will be uh, the link that we need uh, more than anything else. In the meantime, I think a little bit of modesty and simplicity about how we make our claims about Jesus, who he was, who he can be, is called for. Martin Luther King, whenever he was asked, uh, uh, what is the relationship between Jesus and God, he used to say simply, well, Jesus is like God, and God is like Jesus. Uh, maybe, that's, uh, maybe that's a good start, and maybe we don't have to go much further than that. But I want to close my questions here. These are the two questions. One about, do we really think this is a secular age? And one is, is the Son of God the best way to go about addressing this age? I want to close with something that, that, uh, that uh, uh, Jim Carroll and I both agree on, I'm sure, because he quotes one of my favorite and his favorite writers and thinkers uh, in the book, namely Albert Schweitzer. And what Albert Schweitzer had to say uh, about Jesus and how we present Jesus in our current world. Uh, this is an eloquent passage, and I, I always love it when I read it and read it to other people. <clears throat> he comes to us as one unknown, without a name. As of old, by the lakeside, he came to those men who knew him not. He speaks to us in the same word, follow thou me and lets us and sets us to the tasks that he has us to fulfill for our time. He commands and for those who obey, whether they are wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings that they shall pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. Harvey, what a, <clears throat> I began my remarks by acknowledging my debt to you that um, with that book, The Secular City, Harvey Cox was the person who invited me to begin to think well of the secular age. So we've come full circle. <laughs> and once again, I'm learning from Harvey. And I'm sure Harvey did not mean to suggest that the secular age is uh, to be regretted. 
I actually want to, maybe this is pushing back, I don't know, but I want to assert the precious importance of what we call the secular age. And the fact that it has, it is existing simultaneously with an obvious, and you're absolutely right to point it out, resurgence, burst of religiosity around the planet when people like you and me learning from you thought a few decades ago that religion was on the way out. That's the way Bonhoeffer seemed to imagine it. Um, turned out, of course, not to be true. But religion is not what it used to be. I would say the secular age has changed human consciousness, including the consciousness of self-identified religious people, whether they know it or not. Let me try to be more specific in defining what I mean by the secular age. We live in the post-enlightenment period where a great leap was made in human thinking. I know there are plenty of critiques to be made of what followed on the Enlightenment, epitomized, of course, in Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot and other, others who have repudiated the tradition in radical ways. We know the Enlightenment needs to be criticized, and one of the things I most value about the Enlightenment is the Enlightenment itself includes principles of its own self-criticism. But the secular age for me amounts to about four specific things that are all human values. One, evidence matters. So beliefs need to be tested against what they lead to in the real lives of human beings. Dogma must submit to experience. That's a flip on the tradition. I think, therefore I am. How do I know that I exist? Not because God tells me or the church tells me, but because I experience myself existing when I think about it. So evidence, the individual. We know that community is a value, but community that swamps the individual is tyranny. And it was only in the post-enlightenment period, I would say in the secular age, that we really understood tyranny for what it is and the right of human beings to resist it. The politics of democratic liberalism are a note of the secular age. Thirdly, the secular age treats history seriously. We are historically minded people. The classic tradition, its truths, its, its cultures, its beliefs, we understand in ways that people who invented it did not. We understand, we understand here in this room tonight more about the Gospel of Mark than the people who read it 70 years after it was written did. We know who wrote it, we don't know his name, but we know the context out of which it came. We know the history of it. And the history of it enables us to criticize it. So that great phrase, historical critical method, is a note of the secular age. And without it, religion is condemned to fundamentalism. And the threat of the secular age, with its disenchantment of the classic mind, is essentially is a good part of what has spawned this religiosity the rise of so-called fundamentalism. Fundamentalists have a right to be taken seriously on their own terms, and they mustn't be denigrated either. But they can be argued with. And in the secular age, I believe it's crucial to argue with fundamentalism. Because take one example, a fundamentalist reading of texts we have learned can lead to murder. So if you believe the Jews said let his blood be upon us and upon their children against a benign Pontius Pilate, then you have license to denigrate and ultimately launch pogroms against Jews. Fundamentalist reading of anti-Jewish texts, anti-female texts, anti-Canaanite texts, fundamentalist readings of Exodus, God giving Israel 
an absolute claim to, to holy land, that fundamentalism is leading to violence in Palestine today. So the fact that there's an upsurge of religiosity doesn't mean that it too doesn't have to submit to what human beings have learned in the secular age about evidence, history, criticism, experience over dogma. The shorthand word for all of this is pluralism. Because even those millions, billion, more than a billion Muslims, even those Muslims uh, around the world who uh, have little or no experience of, or if they have experience of it, perhaps patience for European notions of post-modernity, even those people live in a world where their neighbors include not just the people in the village, but the people across, across the planet. The crisis of Ebola was a world crisis, even though it happened in a relatively small section of West Africa. Pluralism is a fact of the secular age in a way that it was not a fact of the pre-secular age. In the old days, you could imagine that your notions of God were the only notions of God. And now you worship God side by side with people who do not worship God or who worship other gods differently. So your worship of God, by definition, is different. And in my view, that's a tremendous boon. I love being a man of the secular age. The challenge to me is, what then does my classic traditional belief as a Catholic Christian mean? And that's why I chose the phrase, the Son of God, because I wanted to put emphasis on that word God. Because a lot of uh, scripture scholarship today is embarrassed by the divinity claims made for Jesus. And they want to de-emphasize them. They want to even throw them out. Some scholars talk about how Jesus never thought of himself as God, and his followers never thought of him as God. Jewish Messiah, perhaps, Messiah, uh, Son of Man, but not divine. And my own strong conviction, having come to it in my old age, is if Jesus weren't regarded as divine almost from the beginning of his movement, we would never have heard of him. All the other claims made for Jesus are not that big a deal. He was ethical, but he wasn't that much more ethical than lots of other folks. He was a resistor to Rome, but there were tens of thousands of Jewish resistors to Rome. T.S. Eliot has an imagined picture of a, a cross on a hill with two smaller crosses beside it. Josephus says there were 10,000 crosses in Jerusalem in the year 70. Crucifixion was mundane. Mel Gibson thinks that Jesus suffered more than any other human being ever suffered, and that's what it took to change the damning God's mind about humanity. Jesus' suffering was mundane. But his suffering is the point to me. The whole thing depends on this simple, and I believe this is why Christianity took off. Because we could believe that Jesus was somehow divine, what we recognized in him was that God, far from willing suffering, which is the way many religious people talk, now this is an exodus insight, because when Moses asked God to identify himself, God said, I see the suffering of my people and I want you to assuage it. God is the one who sees not the sin of the people, but the suffering of the people. And that insight in Exodus is brought for us Christians to a pitch with Jesus in whom we recognize God suffering with us. And it doesn't take our suffering away. It changes its meaning. And if Jesus isn't divine, he's another fellow sufferer, but it doesn't change the meaning of suffering. It's absurd. Because Jesus is divine, somehow, you mentioned the Trinity. The Trinitarian language, Harvey, is part of what I would say is, should be on discussion, uh, coming out of Greek philosophical categories. I myself am much more inclined to the Hebrew categories, the, the, the categories of Israel. I, I think, I mean, I'm I'm not proposing to have done any of this. I'm proposing this is the project for the next generation, the next century that has to be done to imagine Jesus as divine in the way that his followers imagined him as divine. 
Paul spoke of the Spirit, it's true, Harvey, but he was not a Trinitarian. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with a certain inevitable vagueness about what I'm saying about the divinity of Jesus. I'm happy to say Jesus was somehow divine. And Son of God says that to me. And I know that in, actually in the New Testament, that phrase is in the whole scriptures for that matter, the Son of God is the people Israel. It's not a divine, a divinity claim for Jesus. Uh, in my book, I lay out the thought of a Talmudic scholar named Daniel Boyerin who explains that son of man, ironically, is a much uh, more direct claim to divinity of Jesus. But I chose son of God taking a clue from Jesus' own impulse to refer to the Holy One as Father. And for me, that's finally it, that Jesus is a presence in the world of the Holy One who is like a loving parent who holds us in the regard that a loving parent holds the child in. So um, the secular age, I, I say yes, Harvey. And the Son of God, I say yes there too. <laughs> but I doubt if we're disagreeing, are we? <laughs> or maybe we are. Uh, thank you very much for the body of your lecture about Jesus. Thank you. And I will learn much more from reading your book as I've learned many years ago from your first nonfiction book, which had a big impression on me, God by Father in the War. Mm. But you framed your lecture tonight. You put bookends around it. I can't breathe, invoking the job which we as white people in this country have finally, I think, realized we have to take on. And I listened very hard, I thought, to how you were going to connect, I can't breathe, with the Jewish Jesus that you, was the heart of, part of the heart of your lecture. But all I heard was what I think is a sort of almost trivial analogy of polarities. And I'd wish you would say more about what you see as the connection with I Can't Breathe. Well, thank you for the challenge to perhaps articulate my point more clearly. <clears throat> for me, and I, I said, I think there may be an outrageous character to this assertion. White racism in the West is rooted in anti-Semitism. That's what I'm saying. And I'm inviting Christians, I'm not assuming everyone here is Christian, I'm inviting Christians to take responsibility for it. That's my simple point. White against black begins in Jesus against the Jews. And my lecture tonight is a shorthand summary of this book that Harvey Cox has just recommended to you. <laughs> and if, after reading the book, the point isn't clear, be in touch with me, and I'd love to discuss it with you further. Thank you. Next. Uh, Mr. Carroll, I have lots of questions that I won't ask because I don't, want, I don't think it's fair to ask an author to explain too much uh, uh, in a book he's just written. But um, I love your columns in The Globe, and I also love the irate responses they regularly generate from um, conservative uh, Irish Catholics. I'm a Catholic myself. I have lots of relatives who fall into the other camp, and that polarity, you know, my understanding of faith is very different from that of other Catholics and other Christians. Um, how do you begin 
this conversation. I mean, one thing I take it you're saying is that we Christians need to talk to one another about these things, but there's often, you know, a huge, seemingly unbridgeable gulf. And I guess my question for you is, how do you um, start the conversation? Well, we're doing it now, and I appreciate your picking it up. Um, I, it, what you said makes me want to emphasize the fact that when we talk about the Holocaust, we usually, we, in our culture, it's talked about as if it's a Jewish subject. So the history of the Holocaust in universities and colleges is a course that students take in a department called Jewish Studies. What is that? No, no. The Holocaust, the history of the Holocaust needs to be taught in the center of Western civilization. The history of Western civilization that's where the Holocaust needs to be studied. The Holocaust is, is a note of Jewish identity, perhaps now, but it remains a Christian problem, unfinished, unreckoned with. And I'm talking, my work is addressed to Christians because we're the ones with the problem. We're the ones with the problem. So yes, we Christians need to reckon with this together. This is a pluralistic, non-religious gathering here tonight, but my message is pointed most especially to Christians. It has relevance, I'm arguing, I hope I could make it more clear in the book, it has relevance for the secular world too. Because secular people, whether they know it or not, are living in a culture that has this bug too. The bug belongs to the West now. And I'm arguing it comes from Christendom. Christendom, this is why I value Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer's great insight was Christendom has just been mortally undermined by what's happening around me in the capital of Christendom, which was the high point of European culture, Germany. If this can happen in Germany, Christendom is undermined. That's what Bonhoeffer saw. He didn't live long enough to articulate it fully or clearly. But that's what I take his genius insight to be. And it was Bonhoeffer who immediately tied it to the fact of Jewishness. What's happening to the Jewish people is the revelation. And the revelation for us is Jesus was a Jew. That emphatic insistent, emphatic point really begins with Bonhoeffer. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Carroll, uh, I was wondering in your look at how Christianity and Christendom has interpreted the life of Jesus, um, if you're influenced at all by the work of William Cantwell Smith and the meaning and end of religion and looking at how uh, religiosity itself and the idea, the discrete idea of religion as an abstract um, it's not an axiomatic part of uh, the life of Jesus, but more of a modern development. Uh, did that in, uh, influence your work at all? Yes, well, I don't know that particular author, but you, you make an important point. Wilfred Let Cantwell, me... Wilfred oh, Smith. Oh, Wilf Wilfred Cantwell Smith. Yes. Oh, sure, of course. And, and the great insight, of course, is that, and Bonhoeffer points to this, is that faith in Jesus isn't about religion. And religion is a... It's one of the inventions of modernity. In the time of Jesus and in the world of Islam to this day, there is no religion separate from the rest of life. There is no separation of church and state. There is no dividing religion off into what you do on Sunday and then everything else. No, it's the whole of life. Harvey, you know more about that than I do. Why don't you offer a thought? Yeah, well, I think it's a good insight that uh, uh, religions as such, were invented in the, idea, the whole idea as a modern idea. And before that, we didn't think of religion as something separate and discrete. And we may be moving to a time now in which we're coming back into that, in which uh, uh, the way you live, the way you live your life, uh, is going to be much more important than the institutional or dogmatic construction of religions. This is why I think the life of the spirit is so important here, because the spirit blows where it listeth. It cannot be contained, it cannot be packaged, it can't be channeled. It's, uh, it's wherever you find it. Uh, and this has important bearing, I think, on the uh, radical religious pluralism that we, that we try to live with nowadays. Right. Yeah, next. 
So um, I would like to maybe ha ask you to comment on a couple of things that are related and also related to the first question that you brought up. Um, you ask, why is it that there is a million and a half Christian, uh, a million and a half, billion and a half, excuse me, uh, Christians on the planet and one one hundredth of that, the number of Jews? And there's lots of reasons, um, but historically, one thing I'd like to maybe point out is Constantine. And that was a time that um, when the church was transitioned from being persecuted to becoming the persecutor, being seduced with power, and it corrupted the church, in my opinion, for about a millennium until the Enlightenment. Um, I don't know how Catholics feel about that because it's all mixed up with Rome, but um, the other thing that, uh, uh, speaking to um, um, I can't breathe, and who, who's Jesus, you know, and, and you know, son of God, son of man, you know, Lord, all, you know, all these lofty titles, but uh, here's a title that Jesus alluded to himself uh, when he identified himself with the least of these. Mm -hmm. Michael Brown, I think it's Michael Brown, mm -hmm. it's the least of these, and Jesus identifies mm -hmm. with him. Yeah, two really wonderfully important points uh, for us to reflect on and broaden our discussion. One, the historical note that the gentleman makes is the absolutely defining and pivotal event that took place when the church became the empire, which is symbolically the moment when Constantine became a Christian, when the emperor became a Christian. And you're right, absolutely, the fate of the Jewish people took a turn at that point because the claims of Christianity began to be able to be made with state power behind them. And one of the effects of that was to drive a complete and total wedge then between the world of, of Judaism and the world of Christianity. Until Constantine, there were, around the Mediterranean world, plenty of communities of people who were partly Christian, partly Jewish, partly Jewish, partly Christian. They were Christians who observed Shabbat on Saturday and participated in the Eucharist on Sunday. There were Jews who observed kosher, but who also uh, took the cup at the Eucharist. And it was with the radical definition of church identity that comes about when the empire begins to impose its order on Christian life that the wall between Jews and Christians becomes defini definitive. It's also the time when heresy becomes defined as a capital crime, and when the empire began to put people to death in the name of the church, and, and so on. Um, the gentleman also called our attention back to Jesus, which is exactly the impulse that we must have which is to measure these historical developments against the memory we have of Jesus. And despite our misreading of Jesus and misinterpreting of Jesus as not Jewish, still the power of this figure comes through bright and clear in the texts. His eschewing of power, his openness to everyone he met, his preference of the table over uh, over the doctrinal argument, if you will. All of this as a Jew, with, firmly within Jewish life. Um, which is why for me, in the end, after theology, uh, we test theology finally against imitation. Which is why Christianity belongs to the imitators of Christ much more than it belongs to the articulators of the theories about Christ. It belongs to the people which is one of the most wonderful things about Christianity. That's why there are a billion and a half Christians whose relationship to theology may or may not be intimate. It may be casual. It may be completely a matter of the theology that's implied in, in the liturgies that they participate in. The imitation of Christ is the great, uh, in effect, uh, test of our belief. 
Yeah, I think that the uh, putting the finger on the change that occurred with Constantine is, is enormously important to call to our attention. And as Jim says, it was not only a time when the when the opposition between Jews and Christians was, was exacerbated, but also Constantine insisted on a universal creed, which had not existed before then, and, and also insisted that the power of the empire and its legions would be brought to bear on those who didn't adhere to this creed. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was if you had one creed, you, you could shore up uh, the empire, which was uh, faltering at the time. It didn't work. Creeds never do. They, 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 they simply stimulate further discussions and further divisions, and more creeds. And, and it was only 50 years after Constantine's uh, takeover, if you will, of the church uh, that uh, the first Christian bishop, bishop Priscillian, uh, was beheaded for his uh, incorrect theological notions. And, and that continued uh, uh, ever since that he was the first victim, you might say, of Christian fundamentalism, enforced by state power. Mm -hmm. It was a total disaster. And, I, and we didn't quite learn that when I was in seminary. I don't know about you. So Constantine was credited with the guy who stopped persecuting the Christians. Uh, and, and what we didn't learn was he started buying off, <laughs> mm -hmm. appointing the bishops, giving them the money, and using Christianity as an instrument for imperial, for his imperial project, mm -hmm. which has been done by more than one empire ever since then. It was a right. very bad turn. So I'm glad we uh, brought that up. And, uh, and we're well rid of it when we can finally get rid yeah, of it. That's true. Yes, ma'am. I'm Marcy Murdinghan, and Hi, Marcy. I have a question that bridges to both of you, I think. Um, picking up on this idea of imitation, and then also thinking of the 21st century and echoes of Constantine in terms of another religious revival that is often not thought of as a religion, and that is the market. Years ago, Harvey, you had a piece in The Atlantic called The Market is God, and it talked about the deification of certain financial metrics and matters that I think many of us would conclude are a source of great uh, pain and suffering in this, in this world we live in. How, where capitalism, or whatever one calls it, where a global economy that's increasingly speedy and linked and inequitable, might we think about imitating Christ as we are the image of God, or how might we participate in mindful imitation to make Christ actual and begin to serve as pilgrims of meaning in redefining what markets are about, or at least pouring more godliness into markets if they are indeed God? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's another reason why uh, the term secular age seems to me a little uh, askew. Uh, what has happened is that a lot of religious impulses have migrated from explicitly religious institutions into other institutions, including in a massive way into the financial sector of, of the world with its temples and its priests and its practices and all the rest. Uh, the, the real reverence now is directed toward the uh, God, the almighty uh, dollar. And, and we do obeisance and, we, we, and, and it's, the, uh, it's the market God through all the advertising that we are subjected to that, who tells us what's wrong with our lives, how to fix them up, what the remedy is. Uh, and we have bought into that somehow without recognizing that in fact what we're dealing with here is, a, is an alternative religion. We don't, like to, we don't think of it that way, but that's really what it is. Uh, it, it's, it spells out some of the great questions that religions have dealt with in the, in the past. The meaning of life and death and suffering and all that. There it is. <clears throat> and it does it in, a, in a, 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 a distorted way. And I think the first step you take is just to not participate insofar as you possibly can in that spurious and, and 
uh, destructive uh, new religion of the market. Step back from it if you can. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's much safer not even to go out of the house on Black Friday, <laughs> let alone uh, to make this a signal that you're not, you're, you're not a participant in this, in this particular ritual. But think about that and think, think about the fact that we, we, we do have this alternative religious system there vying for our attention and doing very well and vying for it. <clears throat> I wish I could take your course. Harvey's, Harvey's teaching a course right now called God and Money, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 much enrolled, important course at the Harvard Divinity School. Can you get close to the mic and tell us what you want to say? Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Carroll and Mr. Cox, is it? Yeah. I'm a little bit of a different specimen here tonight. Um, I'm in my 78th year, and I sort of took a dare from Arthur Halberstam, David. He said the civil rights movement was led by the youth, and the youth of America really changed America. So he sort of wanted to know, well, where were the elderly? So I took a dare, and I'm trying to help change it. I'm trying to get to the nit grid of it. But I have a couple of questions. They're very short, and please bear with me. Mm -hmm. Let's hear them. Mr. Carroll, what would you, I want you to know, I grew up under Jim Crow. I don't understand a lot of your language, and I come to the game, uh, Cambridge Farm trying to pick your ideas and try to take leaps and put things together. So remember that when you get ready to respond to me. <laughs> what would you say to me if I should say that if you go to the, Boston, to the Boston Globe Library tomorrow, there's a magazine, the Boston Globe magazine, and there is a man, I can't think of his name, but he's on the cover. And he has a quotation on the front of the cover. He has made his living by using the microscope to study every system of the body. He magnifies and magnifies and magnifies. And the one thing that he has concluded, no matter who your maker is, I'm not giving your maker a name, but his work is spectacular. Now, you can find that. I'm sorry, I don't know the name, but that book is there, and those are not my words. What if we should give up all this language about Catholic, uh, Allah, whatever we want to call? And what if we just said, oh, that's my maker, mm -hmm. and what I'm due to give him is the word of the day maybe should be gratitude. Mm -hmm. And if we practice gratitude, we're in debt to somebody. So what are we going to do on the surf? We're going to take care of each other. End of the story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. that's how we honor our maker. We don't need to fight wars about what our maker is, so I think. Now, I told you I'm from, I picked cotton, I'm from the South. If you wanna correct that, I'm up for it. <laughs> I came here to learn. The other thing I want to say to you, well, let, and- let, let's, uh, let's have Jim respond to that much so far. And okay. We can... Well, I just wanna thank you for that beautiful statement. I think you've explained the mystery of our experience and the language we try to use for it about as well as anybody can. Yes, yeah, so that's it. It came from the article. And well, it came from the article, but you picked up on it. And yeah. what I heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard you say that the point of this work of the microscope is that no matter how far into the mysteries of what you're looking at through a microscope you go, you see the wonder 
of yes. what has been made there. Exactly, sir. Mm -hmm. He says the more he magnifies, the more complicated it is. The more he magnifies, he, the more complicated. Yes, and he uses he yeah. utilizes the word spectacular. Yes, and it's and spectacular. And he utilizes the word, I don't know who your maker is, right. but this exemplifies spectacular work. Well, it, it just makes me realize you're, you're bringing us to the edge of, of what we can express with our language. And you, you've done it beautifully. And it makes me realize that we're all at that edge of not actually being able to explain what we're reaching for. We're, we have a desire. And, and it seems to be human that we're constantly pursuing that desire. And maybe we can use the word maker yes, sir. for uh, what we're reaching for. Yes, sir. And maybe others use a different word. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad you chose the example you chose because for me it represents the beauty of science, the sacred character of science, whether a scientist is inclined to use language about the sacred or not, yes. it is sacred that we are now so able to see, to experience at a far deeper level, the gift mm -hmm. we've been given. Yeah. And I love the point you made that the response to our experience should be gratitude. Didn't yes, I hear sir. you say that? All the way, gratitude. And, and I couldn't agree more. And if our response is gratitude, I, I myself, maybe you would join me in this, um, if, if you're grateful, it seems natural to move to the next level and identify the one to whom you're grateful. Yes, sir. If you are grateful, then you don't get confused with being demanding respect. Respect True. can go either way, me, True. you. But grateful goes to whoever made me. It goes one way. You know, but I, I want you to know this is not my language. I, uh, I, the article is in your library, and uh, I, all I can remember that his name started with an A. He's, he's worked on the project about 30 years, and uh, he's, I think there might be about 11 systems in Grey's Anatomy. And he's taken each one of them, magnifying them millions and millions of time. And the farther he goes, the less likely he is to find differences. So I just wondered, what would you say to me if I said, maybe we can start talking about uh, this Son of God, Jesus, the Christ, or whatever? Change the language. I say, I say, Amen. Okay. Okay, I, I just have one more question, sir. Another question. I, it won't take me but a second. Um, you, I don't think you need any buttering up from me. I want you to understand that. And what I'm getting ready to say, I want the audience to know about it, the audience. I, um, I won the lottery one night. I ended up in the, boss, in the public library of Boston. Don't ask me how I got there. And then somehow I wandered into the RAB building, the RAB auditorium. And they said, well, there's a man, he's going to discuss Constantine's ward. Now remember, I came from the cotton fields. I don't know anything about Constantine's ward, never heard it before. But I thought I'd go in and look to see what was happening. Because remember now, I'm trying to overcome Jim Crow and the impact it has on my life. When I got in there, it was shoulder to shoulder, standing room only. And Mr. Carroll was at the platform. I had never seen him before, didn't really know who he was. All I knew, he was tall, attractive. And, <laughs> and he was talking to his audience. And he dared his audience. This audience, I took it, probably were all Harvard people, mm -hmm. highly intellectual people. 
And usually when the speaker hit the platform, they are ready to ask you a thousand questions. I've seen it. So Mr. Carroll got up and he told that audience, not in a booming voice like today, but very quietly, uh, he said to his audience, you're not, uh, you're not speaking into the mic. Oh, now, I'm so sorry. He said to his audience, you know, not one of you in here special. He was a little annoyed, so I thought about some group kept silence while oppression was going on. Now, I don't know the history, but I thought that's what was edging him on, you know? And he looked at them, and they got very quiet. They didn't say a word. And he backed off. And he looked at them, and he said, do you know how I know? They didn't say a word. You could hear a pin drop. He said, not one of you can tell me you have a safe space. OK. <laughs> well, apparently, this is a, a reader who appreciated Constantine's sword. Yeah. <laughs> You ought to be gratified for that, and I hope she's also appreciative of the, uh, of the newest book. Yes. I'd like you each to comment on the widely reported in the media all the time about the decline of mainline churches and how that is perhaps um, connected to what you're talking about um, and why that's happening, um, and, and where's that going to go in terms of someone who grew up in a mainline church, it feels like they're disappearing. Um, and also the widely reported that uh, so many people identify themselves, particularly younger people, as nuns, no religious affiliation. Um, and what does that mean? <clears throat> well, I'm not particularly concerned about the decline of any denomination or denominations. Uh, one has to remember that these things wax and wane over the years, and, and that's, uh, it's not something of, of major concern. Uh, I hear a lot of people talking about the disappearance or decline of Christianity. The fact is that Christianity is growing faster today than it's ever grown in, in, in its history. It's not, it's not the kind of Christianity most of us might be used to. It's growing in Latin America and Africa and on the Asian rim and in China. It'll be a very different kind of Christianity. And if it's not mainline Protestantism, uh, I, that doesn't break my heart. I mean, the, things come and things go. And I, I'm, I'm part of a mainline Protestant tradition myself, but uh, it's not going to be here forever. It's not eternal. It, it, it has its own responsibility. As far as the spiritual but not religious people, uh, I, think it's, I think it's very hopeful. These are people who want to uh, relate to the great mystery, to the spiritual dimensions of life, but are very suspicious of the packaging in which it's been delivered to us, the institutional and dogmatic packaging. They want to, they want to get, they don't, they say, we're not atheists. They all say, no, we're not atheists. Uh, and I think it's a good uh, uh, warning to institutional churches and to the theologians that, uh, uh, people want to people want to taste the real product. They want to experience the real product and not look at the labels and packages and, and be caught up in them so much. I, I would make two quick points, one dark and one bright. The, the dark one is with a focus on Europe. The decline of the practice of religion in Europe, we should think much more seriously about that. It's astonishing the disappearance of Europe. Europe is a post-Christian world. And I, I think there are many ways to account for it, and sociologists have written many books trying to understand it. For me, given my obsessions, there's a very basic ground of that complete collapse of religion, and it's the Holocaust. A continent-wide culture saw the radical failure of religion in the greatest moral test of the century. How could it not have undercut religion? Second point, the bright one. In the United States, I think that the values of mainline Protestant traditions, which were explicitly defined in powerful ways around an agenda of social justice, equality, and fairness, have been realized powerfully in American culture. 
The civil rights movements are the most powerful example of that. Uh, the, ra the, the reckoning, the beginning of reckoning with, the, with slavery and its aftermath. Obviously, we're not finished with it. But the women's movement, the gay lib liberation movement, the, the movement for equality and respect for all people, those values came into the American mind more out of Protestant culture, including the black churches, uh, than any other single place, I would argue. I don't know what you think, Harvey. And, and I think one of the th things people experienced was kind of the triumph of the purpose of mainline Protestant traditions. So there's a way in which the decline of mainline religion can be understood as a, as a victory because so many of its values were taken over by the broader culture which was hostile to them in the beginning of the 20th century, the Jim Crow period, the period when women weren't allowed to vote and when gay people had to be in the closet. And all of that changed in that century. And Protestant America is a major reason why that happened. Mainline Protestant America, not evangelical. Protestant America. Okay, we'll have one more question and then I think that'll terminate us for the evening. Yes, sir? Thanks to both of you for so very much. I'm uh, wondering about how we bring it together and take it with us in a simpler way. And I think it has to do with the notion that uh, we have to have it broken down and the old image of prayer, study, and action, very simple, the imitation, living it out, seems to get tangled up because of words. And so it seems like it all turns on that the language of God is silence. And if we can bring that somehow out there more, it's coming but it has to be the base of how it turns if we're to figure out how we discover one another's humanness and the divinity of who we are as a global people on this fragile earth. So my question is, how does silence open up the imagination so that we make it different through all the things that you have been urging. How does silence take us there? Because we're not going to get there, you know, through the quickness of twits, I'm, uh, Twitter and um, all the words that are coming. We have to get there somehow in relationship that comes out of silence. Uh, could you respond and offer any particulars? Thank you. Yeah. Jim? Uh, no surprise, Brian, that you would offer such a deep and powerful last word for us, which is an invitation to look at the limits of words themselves. We're Christians are, have a faith built around this notion that the word became flesh. The word, I hear, that's what I heard you talking about, the, the words in action and words beyond the simple spoken word, and it's when the spoken word becomes taken as the only thing that we have the idolatry of doctrine, the idolatry of dogma, the idolatry of, of structures of cult and all of that. And you're right, silence is what protects us from the idolatry of the word. And it prepares us to go back into the word because finally the word is where we have to live. The word is how we are together. The word is the way we express ourselves. And that we, we don't know what we've experienced until we begin to express it. And the, if there's a built-in tragedy to the human condition, isn't it that every expression we have of our experience falls short of what it was? And so we, we give full expression, the fullest expression we can to our love or to our hurt or to our hope, and we're misunderstood or we're not heard or no one quite gets it at all, really which is why in the end, in the biblical tradition, certainly, the return is always to the act of compassionate love as the defining note of what God's presence in this people really means. 
It isn't the words, it isn't the one who says, Lord, Lord. It's the ones who, in real, concrete, specific ways, loves the neighbor, loves the one right next door. So it's a great uh, thing to be invited to close with. Um, it makes me very conscious of the limits of my own words. Um, I thank you for your patience. I have to conclude by re repeating myself the honor it is to be on the platform with Harvey Cox and to have had this thoughtful um, elucidation of these great questions by Harvey Cox is a privilege for all of us. So I invite you to join me in thanking Harvey Cox. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you all. <laughs>